Okay, I think I think we're good to start. We've got some people who've joined. So everyone's ready on the panel. We're gonna we're gonna kick off. So before we get started, just a reminder that we are recording today's webinar to ensure that all those who've signed up can can listen along. So just in case you wanted to know. Um so let's let's get started. Uh so I am really excited to be chairing this panel today. Um, about our content package on life as a black student from our platform student space. So just introduce myself first. My name is Yemma Noobaba. My pronouns are she, they, and I am the interim CEO at Student Minds. Before that, I worked in higher education at King's College, leading on our student outcomes and transitions programs. Um, so I'm just really excited about the breadth and high quality of this content package we're talking about today, which I know will and has had a profound impact on students across the country, as well as staff um, who will want to better understand how they can support their students. Um, so I hope that you really get a lot from the panel today, um, who'll be talking a bit more about the package. But before that, um, probably worth talking a bit about what student space is. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an explainer, um, but also we'll bring a bit to life as we talk in the, the panel um, as well. So since August 2020, Student Space has been supporting students across the UK to navigate the uncertainty of student life. So the programme is funded by the Office for Students and MEDA, formerly the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales, with an additional grant as well from the Charlie Watkins Foundation. So the three main ways the platform supports students is for its information, tools and student stories, where Life as a Black Student features as a content package. So the university support directory um, is where students can find the support available to them at their specific universities by searching. Um, so we contact, we contact institutions regularly, I think annually, to ensure their entry is up to date. But if you do notice that your entry needs some changing, feel free to contact the student space team at any point and we can make some updates. And finally, we have um, uh, signposting. So we signpost the services providing text, email or website support for a number of different um, student community groups. So the Life as a Black Student content package was a, a truly collaborative project, meaning we had an ensemble of talented students and experts involved, a handful of which we'll be meeting shortly during our panel discussion. So firstly, we have Andy Russo, who led on this project and was responsible for much of the content, a producer as part of it. He also facilitated the steering group, who consisted of eight Black students studying across the UK, and he came from a range of backgrounds offering truly intersectional perspectives. And two members of that group, Evangel and Taj, have joined us today. We also have the Colourful Minds team, who are clinical leads for the project, and their charity compromises of professionals working in various roles across NHS and the wider health sector. And uh, they provided clinical oversight of all the content produced with their special understanding of Black mental health. And finally, one of the content outputs of the project was a podcast series we'll talk about a bit later as well, which was produced in partnership with the All Things Mental Health Project. And this series is available to listen to either on the Student Space website itself or on all streaming platforms, including Spotify, Apple Music, if you just search All Things Mental Health. So I'm going to talk a bit briefly about some of the resources of the package. So across nine months, the individuals mentioned in the previous slide and Student Minds worked to identify some challenges for students, um, for Black students in higher education, and produce a number of interventions resulting in over 20 resources in the Life of Black Student content package. So here's a little bit of a summary of the content, but we'll obviously speak more to that um, during our conversation today. So firstly, we have uh, the written pieces. Um, so this is just a handful of titles, but as you can see, it's a range of topics, including navigating Black student life from an academic perspective, social perspective, navigating intersecting identities, and much more. The written pieces were authored by a mixture of both Andy and the Black students themselves. And one of the key takeaways from the steering group meetings was the emphasis the group put on how valuable it was for students to be able to receive advice and support from their peers themselves. And so we're really excited to have such a great uh, level of student content included in this package. And finally, we also produced five podcast episodes um, with All Things Mental Health, which are all now um, live. And each episode is a conversation between two Black students on topics on the screen. And we also worked with a brilliant student illustrator, Jarde, who produced the episode cover art you can see on the right of the screen as well. 
So after the webinar, we will be, if you are convinced, I guess, that the resources are valuable for your students, which I hope you know you will be, there's lots of ways you can spread the message. And so following the webinar, we'll be emailing you all with a comms pack with assets, including social media posts and stories, printable posters, newsletter blurbs that you can sort of use in your institutions. So please feel free to share it with your student communities, but also with your staff as well. Okay, this is definitely enough talking from me. I'm now going to introduce our lovely panel and get started with a panel discussion. We'll have about 40 or so minutes for this panel, and then we'll have a bit of like 10 minutes to ask questions at the end of the session. So please do add your questions into the chat and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible um, during our conversation. So give me a moment to stop sharing so you can see all the faces of our panel. Fab, that's worked for me. Okay, amazing. So I'm firstly going to allow the panel to introduce themselves. So starting from Andy, if you can just introduce yourself a little bit to the panel um, and then also give us a little insight into what motivated you to get involved with the Life as a Black Student project. Yeah, of course. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to see a lot of people here and a lot of people chatting in the uh, in the box as well. That's really good. Um, my name is Andy Owusu. Good to meet everybody here. I am a PhD student at London South Mac University. Um, I'm an author and I am also a consultant in higher education regarding student services, uh, focusing on um, students of colour um, in a mental health support. Um, what I did with this project or my motivations for getting uh, involved in this project rather was because I wanted to contribute to my community. Um, this has been much of the motivations for a lot of the work that I'm doing, both in my master's, my other research projects with the OFS um, and my current PhD. Everything I'm doing is sort of to be able to contribute to the development um, of my community and uh, my specific or personal goal is to try and help change the narrative of uh, mental health within the black community. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about me and why I'm sort of involved in this. And I'm sure we'll get to find out a bit more later on. Can we have Taj and then Evangel? Yes, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Taj. I'm an activist and community organizer. I recently completed my bachelor's degree at King's College, and I'm about to start my master's in about a month at LSE in London. Uh, I joined this project mainly because of the lack of kind of content for Black LGBTQ plus students kind of out there. Um, largely because it's kind of hard to engage Black LGBTQ plus students for a myriad of reasons. Um, but I just wanted to be a voice in that space where I haven't seen anyone before. Um, I'll pass it to Evangel. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Taj. Um, my name is Evangel Onwaso, and uh, I've just recently rounded up my project, uh, my master's degree in um, Angli Ruskin University, and I'm currently preparing to go for my PhD. Um, well, I was more interested in joining the uh, student life um, because I needed an experience uh, working in you know a setting like this that I would also take on to my um, non-governmental organization that I opened back at home before coming here. And also because I really, really wanted to share my experiences um, as a black student because in the UK, uh, since coming to the UK, because I felt like there was no a lot of community, you know, supporting new black students or people that are just trying to navigate their way around here. Mm -hmm. So I saw it as an opportunity to, you know, share my experience and help as much people as I can. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I think a common theme, I'm sure, across the, the whole um, steering group is that just desire to really feel heard in a way that could be like truly impactful. And so we're really, really excited to just hear more from you today about kind of the yeah what you got from this this package. So let's kick off and explore some of the key themes identified by the steering group. Um, which has kind of translated into this um, content. So you had a number of sessions across around nine months where you touched on a wide variety of themes uh, impacting the Black student experience in our education, from academic pressures, intersectionality, to the importance of community and social inclusion. But I want to ask you all, which of the many things you discussed during the um, your sessions most resonated with you during your time on the role? So open question to anyone to kick us off. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Yemi. Uh, well, there were a lot of discussions, you know, in the steering group. And to be honest, it's quite hard to narrow it down to say which particular one spoke directly to me. Um, I'm going to maybe shine the light more on um, imposter syndrome because that was part of the uh, things I talked about in the podcast session we recorded and then also talk about um, community, we talked about academic pressures, talked about being a leader, a black student leader in a setting that doesn't particularly encourage or give you the much support needed to be an effective or you know reach your full potential as a black student leader um we talked about academic pressure the pressure to succeed especially as an international student who has just come into the uk and um because due to how expensive the tuition is how expensive you know the travel the visa and all that to get you here and then for some people you might be the first person in your probably family to you know come abroad and do higher education and stuff like that so coming from the background we come from you are expected to deliver 210 plus percent nobody expects 100 percent from you so you have to go above and beyond regardless of what your mental state is at the moment regardless of um the pressure of having to adjust find yourself in a new environment um try to go back to what you thought life was normally to what you see life as at the moment in a new environment and then still have to combine that with you know being academically sound um it's not talked about enough if in my opinion it's not talked about enough and um, the steering group gave us an opportunity to shine light on you know this um lack or you know but for lack of a better word, I'm going to say lack um, in our community. So these were some of the things that, you know, resonated with me, trying to find myself. I'm still trying to find myself at the moment, but it felt a lot more easier, a lot more better, and um, gave me a lot, lot, lot of insights on how to, you know, navigate finding myself better in the environment of finding myself. Yeah, yeah, I can add to that. I think for me, it's also pretty hard to to narrow it down because it was all kind of relatable. And I think that was kind of the beauty of the experience and why it was cathartic, I think, in a way, um, because we all got to relate to each other um, and identify the similarities, but also the differences, which I think might surprise a lot of people because they kind of view Black students with a monolithic view, but there's a lot of depth and breadth to experience some of us being international student, students, some of us not being international students, where we come from internationally versus being from the from Africa or from the Caribbean. Um, all of those experiences can kind of impact uh, Black students' experience. And I think that speaks to intersectionality as well, which was the topic of my podcast and I guess the topics of my articles as well, um, which was kind of the importance of understanding that Black students kind of exist across the board and have all other identities as well. Um, and so we really can be like pigeonholed to one area. And I think it feeds into all the other topics, for example, leadership. Uh, Black students are almost exclusively uh, encouraged to run for leadership positions in the ACS um, or as a Black student officer, but really are they able to secure positions in other larger societies or in general kind of sabbatical officer roles, which I think speaks to a lot of the challenge Black students face in terms of one, finding community um, and two, like, have any space to kind of do what they want outside of society's expectations. So I think the intersectionality piece was the most important for me because it feeds into all the others. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Sash. Um, I think, like these guys have mentioned, a lot of the topics were very relatable and very a lot of them were connected um, in itself. Uh, for me, a few that stood out would have been sort of sensitivity towards uh, mental health questions. So right at the beginning of the session, um, after doing the introductions, we I did a little exercise with the with the students where we just spoke about mental health, what mental health means to them, 
um, what their perceptions are of it, what they think others' perceptions are of mental health within our community and externally as well. Um, and then in the beginning, it was just a lot of silence. Nobody really wanted to sort of go first, you know, because there's so many different um, attitudes towards mental health within the community. Um, one of them be sort of being uh, being re reminded of sort of the stigma that is attached to it as well. So mental health that doesn't necessarily mean a negative thing, but when you're often in that situation or speaking about it, a lot of people are thinking, okay, I need to talk about you know the heavy mental health things, you know that pop culture sort of shows us on on TV and stuff like people with schizophrenia and hearing voices, all that kind of stuff. But there's so much breath uh, to, to the topic of mental health, and it's just that attitude of oh, we're talking about mental health. Let me get a little bit more reserved now. Uh, or something that really sort of stuck out to me. And then as we got more comfortable with each other, um, we had some amazing discussions um, in there. Another thing that really uh, sort of stuck out to me with the number of students that we had was their experiences from like all over the UK. Although as um, Taj has mentioned, some people tend to see uh, black students as sort of like a homogenous group. There were so many different uh, experiences uh, based on where a person is from, their current situation in terms of what um, where they are in their uh, academic journey, um, sort of the socioeconomic status as well, the support that they are perceiving that they receive, um, and the role that they're playing in their university were all different uh, things that really impacted how a person spoke about uh, mental health. Um, and it was something that I really, it was, it was a very powerful thing for me. Um, considering that a lot of these students are also people in leadership positions uh, for the most part. So these are people that aren't really um, shy about responsibility or being vocal. Um, but the topic of mental health itself was something that was um, sort of tiptoed around for a while until we were fully comfortable enough and in our spaces uh, to be able to talk about it because they realized that this was that kind of space to to discuss and to let this conversation flourish. And at the end of the of the sessions overall, I think it was really amazing to have seen the change in narrative and tone from the students um, who were able to discuss things at length and even go forth to be able to produce uh, pieces from it as well. Um, another key part that Taj mentioned was the bit about intersectionality. That was uh, one of the key themes that sort of stuck out for me as well, which was being able to sort of, so intersectionality is looking at the framework that forms who we are, the social categories that we subscribe to um, and form the layers of our identity that we have. Um, and being able to recognize that there are differences and nuances even within um, a Black student, what a Black British student might experience versus what an African international student might experience no, or a Black American student might experience is very different. Um, and even some of the support spaces that I'm sure a lot of the universities will have available uh, for students. When we did discuss that, one of the things that I really learned, and Taj was one of the main advocates for this who taught me this, was that with for example, Afro-Caribbean societies within the, the universities or with Black students' networks within the universities tend to have a certain demographic or certain uh, tint of, let's say, religious aspect to it. And therefore, those who don't necessarily subscribe to those um, elements of society don't always feel like that is a, a space for them to feel supported from. So whereas a lot of people might think, okay, the Black students of Afro-Caribbean society for, you know, their networking and for the social support and for their community, there are some people on the outskirts of that because they don't necessarily subscribe to certain things that the majority or the minority are, are subscribed to. So they also are lacking um, in that element of support. Um, and that's something that I really learned from being with the students. And that was, if that's a lesson that I've learned of someone who identifies as one of the members of the community and you know, I've been an advocate in this um, in this space for quite some time and have built a career over it. I'm still learning to, learning things and how to support our students uh, a bit more. Um, I can only imagine what it would be like for somebody who's not within that space um, and how much more do they sort of have to learn. So these are sort of the elements that sort of stuck out for me to keep it brief. <laughs> I could keep talking about this all day. Um, sort of stuck out for me in terms of the themes. Um, intersectionality is definitely a big, big part of it. Um, and being able to create or co-create um, support that is tailored to our various students um, is definitely um, worth doing and something that I, we try to do and I think we have done um, and it will be impactful going forward. So I'll leave it at that, yeah. Thanks, Andy. And I mean, it's a credit to you that you've been, you were able to create such a space where such rich discussion was had. Um, I think one of the things that really resonated as you were all speaking, and I think it speaks to something that Evangel talks about in her podcast episode um, about not having to represent like a whole group 
that you're just your own you're just like you're just one version of a, a black person if we want to call that so I, I think it's just incredible that you were able to do this work where you, you know universities and students can can resonate with the content they've created but I think it's also a bit of a challenge as well in that you can't just start you can't just stop with this sort of content you need to do more and actually interrogate your own institutions and find the the unique perspectives that your your students within your institutions will have as well so I really see this content as like the start for institutions when they're thinking about how they can best support that student so uh, obviously I'm a big advocate for this I think if I was at university if I was at university now it would be so incredibly uplifting to see this sort of like content really being um, just shared in a really authentic way so honestly credit to you all for this this content and we'll talk about the content a little bit more but before we go into some of the specific themes that were discussed in the package I think a lot of university staff watching will be very curious to know how the co-creation itself went and if there are any useful tips for staff uh, to take away when they're thinking about their own um, content co-creation with black students so let's talk a bit about how exactly we went about doing this package so Andy, can I ask you again to, to kick us off and sort of give us an overview of the process um, of doing this over the nine months with Student Minds? Yeah, of course. Um, so with the process, we really had to set out what our goal was, um, which for us was to, to try to get a better, a better understanding of the current experiences of our students um, within the universities and how uh, their experiences are, are impacting their mental health and their well-being. Now, obviously, the... the experiences will differ going across the country so your, your universities will be very have very unique data if you were to repeat this um this study or to repeat this um this project um in terms of what the interventions that will be developed that might be suitable for one university would not be so that's where the element of co-creation begins right at the start um where we wanted to get our students input from the start of the project all the way through to the end being able to um facilitate exactly uh for for us as researchers where they want that data to go and what they want it to reflect um, and therefore that solution that will be developed from that data will be targeted to that specific experience or experiences that were discussed in there um, so what we wanted to or what we did rather was to um, invite our students from various spaces um, with the aim of creating sort of psychoeducation themes and approaches um, and interventions and resource, um, resources to help support our students um, through the element of co-creation um, and of course, we also had like clinical uh, reviews with this co-creation element, but I'll get to that later. But yeah, so to begin with, we sat down with our students um, doing a couple of exercises and looking at mental health um, and their experiences um, of support from support services within their universities um, and how it's impacted them in their academic journey. Um, and then from that discussion, a lot of qualitative data is collected. Um, and within that, you can see sort of the themes and patterns that tend to arise from our students. Um, and you guys will probably have a guess as to what some of those themes are. But again, with some of the things that I've learned being in that room, um, it's all not always the service level things. And definitely something that I, I was able to learn as a, picking up more on, the, more on the depth of intersectionality from students like Taj and Evangel. Um, there are different layers that aren't always visible to us from a staffing point of view and only can be sort of expressed by the students on a, uh, in a student uh, from a student perspective. Sorry. So being able to have these discussions and have the right questions to be able to facilitate that, the right space and the right people in the room to safeguard both ourselves and the students and make them feel comfortable, um, which Student Minds, of course, provided, um, helped us to be able to develop that um, those themes a bit more. And then through the process of refinement, we didn't do just one or two folks, we did quite a few. Um, we presented the, the initial themes. We discussed it and highlighted and um, sort of prioritized because we can't do everything, but we do what we can. So we prioritize exactly which ones um, are more sort of salient to our students, are more relevant uh, to them um, and has more of an impact. Should we be able to create a solution? Right. So in an ideal world, which one of these things, if solved today, uh, would propel your academic career and your experience of belonging at your university um, the most? Um, and then from about. I think we had over 18 sort of themes. We maybe put it down to about, I think, nine or so, which was still quite a bit of a refining process. But of course, some of them are interconnected, as we said. So it was able to, able to sort of pair them off um, in this specific process anyway. So obviously, when you do it, it may be something different. Um, so yeah, 
going uh, then from being able to pair up the themes or being able to develop them um, through uh, by picking up the pat patterns and then developing the themes even further, we then identified these are concrete um, sort of challenges that we've identified with the students, confirm it with the students again. Um, and then from there, we have a different set of, set of focus groups where we're looking at developing solutions for these identified challenges. So we have, uh, like I mentioned, over 18 sort of themes or challenges that were identified. And okay, what can, what do, or what does a solution look like for this specific challenge? And just doing that process again for the rest of them. So obviously there'll be different solutions for different people. Um, and ideally how they'd also like to receive that um, solution, um, what kind of uh, format they would like to receive it on. Some people are visual, some people are audio, some people want to read a bit of a lengthy thing, some people want to read a short format. Um, so yeah, looking at what the solution is and how to best uh, communicate that to our students. Um, and of course, within that solution as well, co-creating it with our students and co-creating it with our clinical uh, partners at um, a Colorful Minds who are able to contribute to that. And of course, with the refinement from student minds who are able to give us sort of the process to work within the policies of what is actually we're able to do um, and give us the platform to then distribute that. Um, so, yeah, having that review, having that process to be able to refine that, uh, to give us exactly what these challenges are, helps us to create what these uh, solutions or these content packages that you're seeing today is, which is our form of uh, of support in in practical resources that our students can administer to themselves. Um, and of course, throughout the process, the skills that we develop, um, the upskilling of the students themselves um, through this process of learning and through this process of actually generating um, something uh, practical to give back to our community. Um, and of course, having the overall evaluation from student minds as to what is this and how is it going to impact our students? Um, and then being able to put that on the website at the end of the day or at the end of the project um, is, brief in discussion but it took quite 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 a bit of time to get all those uh, all those little things uh together and to get of course the data analyzed to get the uh the results in to be able to um, give it back to the students and to refine that process over and over again uh to get to the point where we are now that's what the appropriation process looks like uh from my perspective thank you andy i mean yeah it was a very, very robust process and i imagine rather intense as well for for you all and I think it's clear, I'm sure, to the audience why having students directly involved in co-creation will create content like this. But Evangel and Taj, um, from your perspective, what was your experience of, of doing this, this work? And why do you think it's so important to have students themselves involved in co-creation projects like this one? It's over to you too. I hope you can go first. I can go first. Um, for me, I think the best part about it was that it was, it felt like true co-creation, which I've been a part of a lot of like, uh, stuff at university or with other charities, um, doing work with students or with certain populations. And it never really feels like co-creation because they always come to you with a, a pre-described idea of what they're looking for or they come with, with, with something already completed and ask you to review it, which is not co-creation at, at all, really. Um, so I really liked that we were able to start from the very beginning and kind of shape the project as it grew, which I thought was really great and a really good example of like true co-creation. Um, I also think for me, like what, what also made it different was that in our sessions, they were facilitated by people who also shared the same lived experience. Um, for a lot of us, so it was fellow Black people, um, which I thought made the space really comforting and made it easier to share as well. Um, and because there was already assumed that level of understanding, even though our experiences are all different, there is some similarity there. Um, I think that was that was really helpful in terms of like everyone being able to be authentic and like truly share the experiences at university. Um, yeah, I think that that was the best two things about the process for me. And I think, yeah, a lot of universities could learn from this experience, particularly. Um, does uh, Andy, your hand is up. Do you, you have a question? Should I go first or would you? Like Please, to... yeah, go ahead. I'll add something at the, at the end. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, uh, Thaj has said, you know, a lot of things, uh, that literally 
felt like he was speaking my mind. So I'm not going to add to it as as to how the experience was for me because Taj has literally said it all. I'm just going to add a little bit to, you know, how the universities can, you know, learn from it. So um, with the experience I got with Student Minds, it gave me this feeling of um, ownership with the project. So, you know, um, it made me feel like my opinion was what literally mattered in um, the development of the project because of how the project was designed. So uh, when we started the um, steering group, what I liked the most was that there were no um, already written down topics to talk about. There were no already written down prompts or, um, you know, words forced to your mouth to, you know, speak about. It was called a student space and actually really did resonate with the name student space where um i remember andy saying uh we're just gonna go with the flow right so more more of what he did was to you know open up the um the discussion floor and then shape the conversation towards you know what the program was supposed to be about but also giving us room to you know give our own different perspectives to the program which is um part of the uh, skills or should I say part of what this program or the project rather um, taught me. It, if I'm going to do something um, related to co-creation with whatever group I'm going to work with, I'm going to let them bring their own perspective to it because the different perspective we brought to the project was what made it what it is, what gave it the life it has now. Um, it also, like I said earlier, it gave us a feeling of um, ownership. Uh, it helped us build confidence in, in relation to discussions surrounding mental health because it was a bit mm, when we started and nobody was, you know, very willing to open up or discuss whatever problems or challenges they were facing. But with time, it got more comfortable we built enough confidence, um, you know, to talk about things that really did matter. And it's just like a knockoff effect because in turn, wherever we find ourselves now, we're going to give other people the confidence they need to talk about this um, problems that they're facing. And then we keep making the discussion grow bigger until, you know, a sort of solution is found to it, if that's the word to use. Um, yeah, I think that's it. It's also okay. Real world experience. Well, I'm not going to say this is not a real world experience because we're all students. But if I'm going to translate it to like work life after university, it gave me some sort of confidence. You know, if I find myself in a very, very professional setting, because this wasn't very professional in the sense that it was sort of informal, like, you know, to give us the freedom we needed. But if I find myself in a very work professional setting, I have enough confidence to, you know, tackle or face this kind of discussions headlong. Awesome. Thank you for that, uh, Evangel. And one thing, I guess another thing I wanted to say that really contributed to the to the focus groups or to the co-creation is to uh, to pay the students. Um, you know, a lot of this work, oftentimes when people carry them out, I've done this work about maybe my fourth time now, I've done a few of these um, where, you know, when you get people who volunteer, you get a certain type or group of people who are already sort of activists in, the, in this sense, and they'll may bring the same or similar perspectives. Um, when you offer up uh, payments to be able to fairly, you know, uh, pay somebody for their time to be able to contribute to your project, you open up space for more, a wider a wider range of perspectives uh, for students who don't usually get involved in this kind of work, students who may not have the opportunity because of external commitments uh, such as work or childcare or et cetera. Um, you know, they're not going to take time off to then come and do this sort of thing uh, for free. And we're taking away like four or five hours of their day at, at a time to be able to run these focus groups. It was quite, quite intensive. Um, so, yeah, given that sort of uh, fair sort of um, payment for it, 
um, really made way for some of these students to be able to, to continuously contribute, uh, which is a key element of it, as I can see by the nodding heads from our students here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've done it with volunteers and you will get great results. Um, but, you know, there's, there's not as much of a range as you will do when you allow a lot more people, it makes your project more accessible um, and you get better impact uh, from it as well. Yes, definitely agree. And before we move on now, I know, you know, no project is perfect. Um, so I would really like if anyone would like to come in, was there anything about the process that maybe we could have done differently next time? So anything you would recommend as areas of the process? I guess that staff who are considering this should be thinking about especially carefully in order to, um, yeah, avoid any, any big issues. So yeah, anyone would like to come in with any kind of top tips on what we can improve by the process? Um, I just have one thing. Uh, while I know that the project was centered around um, mental health, um, there was a time it got really intense, right? And it felt like there was a lot of tension and pressure in the room, you know, where everybody was sharing and all that. Um, we did take a break, but it would have been nice to, you know, have... Um, a different conversation, probably not about mental health, it could be about any other thing, you know, just to lighten the weight, you know, make you get back into the zone and then start to share again. So it would have been nice to, you know, take a detour from the mental health conversation at some point. But overall, it was a really, really nice project put together, but that was just it. And Taj? Yeah, I think for me, it would be two things. And the first thing would be time. I think it would any project would benefit from more time. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a given. Um, but I think the other one would be like, we had a lot of suggestions and recommendations, um, especially around how the package should look. And I think having budgetary constraints, knowing what the budgetary constraints are from the beginning will be super helpful. So it would just stage what like the students can expect from the outcome and what the outcome would look like and kind of what the budget is around ensuring, making that happen. Um, I think that would be the only thing, major thing for me, I think. Uh, thank you. I think that's probably really helpful for people who are considering this as well. And for us, of course, at Student Minds. Okay, so let's discuss the content package itself and the outputs that were created. So this is just a, an open one to all of you, really. So obviously you all wrote articles and Evangel and Taj, you'd recorded podcast episodes. Uh, so is there anything in particular about the topics that you chose you'd like to sort of speak to and any sort of key takeaways you want to give to the audience about what you discussed? Um, oh, don't worry, Taj, you can go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, in my podcast episode with um, one of our co-creators, Michelle, we talked about um, imposter syndrome, leadership, and how it affects our lives as Black students. And part of the reasons why I really wanted to talk about imposter syndrome is because I struggled, I still struggle with it, but not to the extent to which, you know, I used to struggle with it before. I struggle with imposter syndrome. I struggle with finding myself um, worthy enough to be in a particular space. And it has really, really rubbed off on me and affected a lot of, you know, opportunities that I should have seized or made the most of but because I was held up by imposter syndrome. So, um, well, okay. This is beginning to feel a little bit more like the um, staring group again, like we're beginning to share again. Um, okay, we also spoke about leadership and, you know, how imposter syndrome has also transferred onto, you know, being student leaders, finding ourselves in certain places. Uh, take I for instance, I'm 
you know, a faculty rep, a course rep, and, you know, um, a conference delegate. And when I was going for the conference, part of the things I spoke about on the, you know, podcast was when I was going for the conference, part of my expectation that wasn't really spelled out to me until I had accepted to go for the conference was that I was going there to represent not just black students in the real sense of the word black students but I was also going to represent other people of color um Arabian Chinese Indian Pakistan you know we're all lumped together to be black students and like I said I can only speak from the experience of being a black person. I can't. I don't. I do not know the experiences of a Chinese person in the UK, or um, a Pakistani person in the UK. So these were part of the things you know we embodied in the podcast and we talked about. Um, so aside personal experience, I also wanted to you know speak up to help others because. I actually did realize after we had um, talked about imposter syndrome in the um, steering group, I came back and I was speaking to a few of my classmates and we all do struggle with it in one form or the other. It doesn't have to be with finding yourself. It doesn't have to be with not feeling worthy. It could take any other form, right? And you need to actually identify what it is before you can be able to tackle it. So these are part of the reasons why I was interested in talking about imposter syndrome. Well, I also wanted to explore, you know, that aspect of mental health, because as much as we say mental health, I feel like it has taken a very particular shape and form where Andy talks about schizophrenia and, you know, all this stuff. That is what is actually painted as real mental health problems. But then the minor ones like, you know, imposter syndrome, intersectionality, um, how religion affects you as a black student and how it, you know, translates into how you handle things and all that, are not seen as the bigger mental health problems. But then these little ones take on the bigger form and then translate into something that was now blown out of proportion. So Yeah, I, I love the idea of thinking about the causes of some of the, the, you know, the impact of mental health that you were talking about. So thank you. Um, Taj, do you want to come in next? Sure. I think the most the most enjoyable topic for me, I think, was intersectionality, obviously. Um, that's what I did my podcast episode about. That's also what my pieces are about in general. Um but my pieces specifically uh, were written kind of as advice to Black LGBTQ plus students from another student because I've rarely ever seen that specifically around one, like safe spaces, ad advice for actual safe spaces that exist and where to find them because that's a huge challenge um, with being kind of a minority within a minority is finding the spaces um, where you can feel safe and your full identity is appreciated. Um, so I wanted to talk about that. Um, and then my other uh, piece was about where there isn't spaces um, that are, that will cover your whole identity, how do you navigate them? So my piece was mainly about how, as a Black LGBTQ plus student, you can nominate, uh, navigate LGBTQ plus spaces, which tend to be predominantly white. Um, and then as an LGB, Black LGBTQ plus student, how you can navigate Black spaces, which tend to be majority cisgender heteronormative heterosexual um so i really enjoyed writing those two particular pieces um because i just felt that i've never seen anything out there like that before and this is what i would have really appreciated that someone told me in my first year at uni um so i kind of wrote it from that perspective um and i just want to say that like i go into these spaces and i'm always worried when it's like when it says for black students or for LGBTQ plus students, because I'm always worried that in the black student one, I'm gonna be the only LGBTQ plus person and my experience is not gonna be valued because it'll be more so about the black experience solely, um, which doesn't exist because we all have intersectional identities. Um, and then when I get to LGBTQ plus spaces, they really wanna touch the topic of race. Um, so I'm always hesitant about what part of myself I'm going to bring and what I'm going to do, what I'm going to discuss. Um, but I really appreciated this focus group because I was actually able to discuss that experience. Um, 
I went in it with the mind thinking I would ex discuss my leadership experience and kind of how my identity has affected that. But I got to discuss my actual experience being Black and LGBTQ+, and kind of what that was like. And that was really great for me, but it also produced content that I hope will help a lot of other uh, Black LGBTQ plus students. Awesome. Uh, for me, I'll keep it brief. I'll uh, do one. Um, I think one of the key pieces for me uh, is the framework for challenging conversations, um, which is really to sort of address quite a simple thing, but a very effective thing, which is how do you begin to talk about um, or how do you begin to seek help from certain spaces? So looking at conversations within uh, your groups, so it could be uh, communities, worship uh, communities, uh, families, and then between yourselves and other people, like again, your family members specifically, or your friends, um, your peers, you know, colleagues. Uh, there's just, the stigma around it oftentimes makes uh, makes the conversation hard. People don't know how to begin um, to to have just a conversation around. You know, I'm feeling a certain type of way, and with certain black students, sometimes having those com conversations with families, depending on where you're from, which generation you're in, um, and you know the attitudes that the families will reflect, can make that challenging. So then you're at home without that avenue of support. Um, so then to try and broach that topic with, you know, very traditional parents, for example, uh, which might be some of the advice that students might receive from from the support services, you know, if you're feeling some type of way or if you're going through this, one of your, one of your support avenues should be a family. And they're right in saying that. But having those conversations is not something that a lot of people would have be able to think about. Um, and something as simple as, you know, how do I how do I begin? Given them so the structure for that framework is just having three ways to start a conversation, um, and then three possible responses um, that you could expect or receive uh, from whoever you're speaking to. Um, not necessarily having to use those specific words, but having just to think around or that process of you know this is the type of way I could communicate this to this certain type of person to this community, even including like religious religious communities. Um, you know, it's it can help quite a bit just to have that sort of example to see that written out because some people have this voice and it's good to see it vocalized and to see it you know written out in the on the website for students to be able to see and just browse through um so yeah that is sort of the key part for me or the key uh piece that I, I wanted to sort of bring forward which was that framework for challenging discussions and you can all probably have or well, uh, role playing in your mind right now have seen a student trying to broach a topic with maybe a lecturer for example who's oftentimes their point of contact at university or maybe a friend who you know but doesn't necessarily have a, a supportive attitude um for a certain level, uh, layer of the, the individual's identity and of course having you know friends and family who may have certain specific views that don't necessarily agree with that student and their views um you know how do you broach that topic within uh with these people so in a way that serves you as a student um, so yeah, all of that is all within that framework, and that's what I want. That's the key part that I'd like to put forward. Oh, thank you. I mean, I now have so many more questions, but we are almost out of time, and I want to make sure people uh, in the the room also have an opportunity um, to get some more wisdom. So, this is a reminder that we are about to get going to questions. So I'm going to be looking at the Q and A tab for any questions that pop up. Um, but one question that I did see that I'm going to um, sort of ask, uh, I guess all of you um, is around communication. So I think that's one of the things that can be really challenging about a project like this over a long period of time. So the question uh, from one of the, uh, the attendees uh, for anyone to answer was, what were the ways that you found most effective in communicating the development of the project to the students? So I'm, I'm gathering this is, how do we make sure that the students were you know, uh, clear on what was happening for all stage stages of the process and felt really bought in? So happy for Andy or one of the, the students really to answer. Um, yeah, so we were transparent throughout the whole thing. So with the element of co-creation is um, just being transparent with everything that we have. Um, we set forward exactly what our goals were, what we were trying to achieve, um, exactly how it would be um, received by others and like, you know, the platform that we're going to put these specific uh, instruments on. Um, what we then left open for discussion or open for interpretation, exactly what those instruments were. And that's where the students came in to sort of fill in those gaps. But essentially, we set, set out the goal where we wanted to, one, we want to hear your experiences. 
What have you been through? What is support like at your institution? Um, is it working for you? Is it not working for you? Pros and cons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then identifying these challenges, keeping that level of communication open was, this is what I found when we I went away and analyzed the data from our conversations that we've had. Um, you know, use qualitative analysis, thematic analysis, whatever you may do. Um, bringing it forth to the students to then confirm that, yes, this is right. Um, and then, of course, the next step is then developing that um, with the students and being able to communicate that is great you have this idea for a specific solution but let's reel it back as to what we actually have the capacity to do um for, as student minds and for this specific uh, site that we're going to sort of be developing and putting our resources on um so yeah that's i hope that answers the question a little bit but that's that's it from me if any of you guys have anything else to add yeah i think i hope that answers the question um um, and then another question um, that we've had is just looking at uh, what universities can do next with this content. So if there was maybe one thing or one key takeaway that you would want your institution, so say the institutions that you've, you've been a part of, to do once they look at this content and uh, engage with it. Yeah, what's one thing maybe that you'd, you'd like your institutions to be doing? I think one of the things would be not to lump everybody together um we are different people and we have different experiences and my experience doesn't necessarily mean that another black female would have the same experience as me or something similar um and i'm a black person i'm not an asian person and i'm not you know a Caribbean person and we are separate people so if you're referring to a particular group of people you have to be quite specific in your reference um, and our differences means that every person have, uh, with their own, their own problem uh, need a different method or solution to handle their own problems so whatever method or solution that worked for me when you know I brought my problem to probably say a guidance counsellor wouldn't work for the next black girl that's entering the room with maybe just the same problems but then you just need a different approach to each person and I think one of the very important questions to ask is to ask how you want to be helped so Asking me how I want to be helped would give you an idea on how to approach whatever problem I've come to you with or, you know, an experience at the time. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. That That's really, really helpful. I think a really important message uh, for those in the room. I think we've got time for maybe two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um. So this is a question for Andy, but I'm going to frame it a bit for, for everybody as well. So um, that one of the um, members asked what type of challenges you face during the project and how you overcome that, how you're able to overcome them. So kind of a general question to you all, I guess. So Andy, as your role um, as the lead um, managing these conversations, how did you manage any of the, the challenges you had and how are you able to support yourself during this process? And what should institutions be considering about the support that we offer to individuals like yourself doing this work? And then similarly for the students as well, um, be good to hear how you were able to support yourself as well. So I'll hand over to Andy and then um, Taj and Evangel can also come in. Um, thank you. Um, so one of the challenges that I always find I face during this type of work is something that Evangel touched on before, which is, to be in a room and in a space like that and creating that environment for some students is oftentimes their first first time being um face to face with somebody who is steeped in like mental health in terms of like their role um and, and like sort of their qualifications and what they do and when we have that discussion around mental health some people can see it as almost like a therapeutic environment because that's oftentimes their first interaction with somebody who's solely discussing their experiences tell me about you know your experience with mental health and support that you've received um so you often get through well get a lot of people maybe oversharing or some things that um you may not be prepared uh to deal with and the way that we sort of overcame that challenge was to be able to have a clinical 
um, presence in the room um, who's not here not here today. Well, there's a, there was a few sort of people who played that role from Colorful Minds. Um, but to be able to have somebody there who was actually qualified in that sense um, to be able to facilitate um, and to safeguard, help safeguard, set those uh, precedents for safeguarding um, and lay out the rules um, before we start. And then for myself, for whoever is carrying out that um, sort of facilitating this focus group or this project, I myself am a CPCAB qualified uh, level two, so I'm learning my uh, my counselling um, sort of skills as well um, as with my qualifications as I'm going along. And it helps me to really facilitate. And should I need to take somebody out of a room and sort of, you know, uh, work with them, I am able to do that. And then luckily we had specific roles for the clinical uh, people to come in and um, play that role should, should that need uh, arise. Um, so that's one of the main challenges is that you get people who treat it as a, as a therapy session, because oftentimes that is their first experience of being in that therapeutic uh, space, um, which is that, of course, no fault of their own. And it's, it's welcomed because we're talking about your experiences, but it can take people back to certain places that they've had maybe negative experiences and having to relive that and then sharing it across with other students as well who may be in that room and oftentimes you get people resonating so that's always a risk that you um you sort of um, have when you do this type of work uh, with our students any further comments from Taj and Evangel on this one no okay I think we might have time for just one more um, and we'll end it there. So someone has just asked, what next? So I'm going to take that as a, what next for you all? What are you working on next? Um, and then we'll wrap up from there. Um, so for me, I'm still doing my my PhD, which is, of course, looking at uh, supporting Black students. The angle I'm taking on my PhD at the moment is going through to reinforce the students' support networks. So more specifically, I'm working with or work planning to work with mental health advisors um, to increase uh, to work on their cultural competencies um, within this, like a training sense or culture um, uh, CPD sense as well. Um, trying to get their experiences um, and trying to be able to work sort of reverse engineer exactly what's going on. As these projects are beginning to set up for students, which is great, but we also need to there's a, there's a two pronged approach, right? We need to target it from system uh, systemically as well. So I'm that's where I'm trying to navigate myself now um, at the moment. So that's what's next for me. And Taj, and then Evangel. Sure. What's next for me? Um, my master's um, in a month, which is very daunting because it's a very scary program. Um, you know, master's of public administration. Um, yeah, in a month. So that's kind of the big thing next. Um, obviously, still being an activist, still being a community organizer alongside that. But the main thing is masters. Um, well, like I said earlier, um, navigating the road to doing my PhD. I should take notes from Andy because um, <laughs> I've heard it can be a very long and tiring journey and um, I'm not particularly sure I'm in the headspace for it yet, but it's something I really want to get done and um, I also want to build my wealth of experience with working with volunteer organizations, non-governmental organizations, because I already have one set up on paper and i would really like to get it up and running as soon as possible so um you know doing all the work taking all the extra courses and navigating my phd life in um, health and social care i'm trying to see if i could get something done you know focusing on mental health or you know just health and social care generally well i'm still navigating that area but like yeah that's the path of tone right now Thank you, everyone. And we wish you honestly the best of luck with all of the very exciting things you've got happening next. So we are out of time. So I want to thank you all on the panel so much for just incredibly insightful. I honestly wish I was a fly on the wall in your sessions during the last nine months, but so lucky that we get to get all this content that you've created. So I really just want to sort of um, leave with the final point that I would really, really encourage you to use this content to be curious, but courageous and think about how you translate this into your own context. Speak to your students as well and make sure you do it in an authentic, 
in a really meaningful and compassionate way. And we hope the content that you've talked, you've talked about today can really support that um, in your institutions. So you'll be receiving the comms pack um, from us uh, later today or this week. So use it. And we really, really hope that it's, it's a useful thing for you all. Um, and yeah, keep in touch if you have any other questions. There were lots of very meaty questions in the, the Q&A. So rather than try and talk about it today, we can, we can send across any information that anyone has after today. All right. Uh, we've got loads of thank yous in the chat. So thank you again to the lovely panel. Um, have a great rest of your day and we will see you all soon.